There is a garden, there is a city, and there's a kingdom of God. And it is beautiful, and he is bringing it right now into our midst. Everybody. This is York, isn't it? And I tell you what, I, uh, I'm ready for some warm weather looking at some of those pictures. How about you? Hey, welcome. Uh, welcome right here on site and also welcome online. And last week, all of you were welcomed online, so really glad that you can join us again online and right here on site. We are continuing on in our Better series, and here's the verse we've been using week after week. Very simply, uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, God says, I know the plans I have for you. That's the New American, uh, that's a new international version. The King James says, uh, I know my thoughts towards you. And then in the message, God basically says, hey, I've got this. I've got this. I've, I, I know the plan. I know what I'm doing. I've got this. Now, we have been uh, looking at the better plans that God has for us, and we started at the, at the basic level, and that is God's got, a, God's got a plan for a better you. And man, we are so passionate about you becoming the best possible version of you that you can become, and we're going we're gonna to do whatever we can this year to make that happen. Now then, last week, as we were all online, as we were all, uh, you know, living word online, we looked at a really significant passage that I think is going to become increasingly important for the church of our times, and that was from 1 Peter chapter 2, and it was all about how do we become a better community, uh, what are the kind of people that make up that better community, what's that better community going to wind up doing, and did you notice, there, I, I mentioned it was a very, very dynamic relationship, a better you makes possible a better church, and then a better church creates an environment where we all become better. So a wonderful, wonderful dynamic that takes place there. Well, today we're going to look at that, that third, now they're growing, and that is uh, how do we make a better community, a better community called York? Because better people coming together in a better place called the church are now positioned to really have an influence in our community. Now, before I get to that, I, I want to give you one more, uh, just one more kind of perspective about a better you. Uh, Lots of research on uh, literature on happiness. How do we become happy? Where do we find satisfaction and contentment? And generally, what our culture is doing is our culture has, has said, you know, if you really want happiness, then well, there's this thing called pleasure. And right now I have this kind of mapped out. There's a pleasure bucket. And do whatever you can to fill your pleasure bucket because as you fill your pleasure bucket, that's when you're going to be happy. That's when you're going to find some satisfaction and contentment. Now, here's the problem about the pleasure bucket is by, by its very nature, it leaks. It leaks a lot. It leaks fast. It leaks on a daily basis. So like every day, you're having to invest more in that pleasure bucket. And when the pleasure bucket gets too low, you feel pretty unhappy. And so then you're motivated to go out and try and get more in your pleasure bucket so you can feel happy again. It feels like we're on a little bit of a pleasure treadmill trying to do that. And also want you to notice that the pleasure bucket itself, it, it leaks, and it's also kind of small, especially when you look at another source of happiness, and that is the researchers have discovered that gratitude is an amazing way to discover contentment and satisfaction when we learn to practice gratitude. Uh, when we learn to understand that life is a gift, when we learn to understand about grace and love and and by the way, that's one of the reasons why you're going to see more and more. I think I've seen it at least a half a dozen times on Instagram. People saying, hey, in 2022, start to, start to keep a gratitude journal. 
every single day, you know, just write down, here's why I'm grateful. You know, here, here's a gift that I've received, and here's how I'm living in grace. I mean, I get that, because the more we see life as gift and grace and love, like, we just start to have a, a sense of satisfaction and contentment that's far, far bigger than pleasure. But here's what's kind of striking, is as a culture, we're not real good at gratitude, and so, therefore, our gratitude bucket, even though it could be so, so much a source of, of joy and happiness, it actually stays pretty empty for a lot of us. And so, at Living Word, one of the things we're trying to do is help you understand that life, Christianity, is gratitude, gift, grace, love. But there's a third bucket that's just enormous in its potential, the researchers have found. And that is this bucket, they call it meaning and purpose. In fact, they found that the more a person deals with pain and struggle and hardship and suffering, the more you need to have a deep sense of meaning and purpose because that is one of the greatest antidotes to your pleasure bucket being drained by pain. I mean, see, that's one of the things that drains our pleasure bucket, pain and suffering, just drains it right out. And, and you just can't, you can't, uh, you have to have something that's bigger and stronger and, and meaning and purpose is amazing in terms of providing a sense of satisfaction and contentment. And once again, our culture is really, really bad on that. I mean, we're really doing a quite poor job of helping people discover meaning and purpose. And so therefore, you know, we wind up missing large amounts of potential happiness, joy, satisfaction, and contentment. Now, the better series beginning today and going to continue for the next two Sundays, we're going to start to really set forth for you a life of purpose and meaning. And as we grab hold of that, we have a real potential to see that bucket growing in its fullness and some deep satisfaction emerging in our lives. Now, Jeremiah chapter 29, we have skipped verses 1 through 9. We've just gone right to verse 11. Well, verses 1 through 9 are some very powerful words. I think along with 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, these verses in Jeremiah 29 are going to start to become some kind of prototype verses that the church of Jesus Christ in North America needs to grab hold of today. These are challenging verses. I mean, these verses are going to kind of push really hard against us. And we might even feel like we're pushing back against them. That's, that's how sort of radically redefining of a new way these particular verses are. And as we do a deep dive into these verses, I'm going to talk about there's like six new things that God is setting forth for his people. Uh, the first two are, are about their new situation. The second two are going to be about their new calling. And the final two are going to be about like sort of this like new faith that will be emerging. And we'll see how many of these we can cover in our time together. So Lord, uh, as, we, as we dive into your word, thank you for your powerful word. It, it, um, it changes our lives, and I pray for each person here, and myself, first of all, that we will allow your words to speak deeply into our souls and our spirits for your greater glory. Amen. Amen. So here's, a, here's a, the first part of the new situation that Jeremiah 29 is all about, and that is there's a new context for the people of God, and the context is called Babylon. In verses 1, 2, and 4, this is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles. And so there were all kinds of people in exile. There were elders, there were priests, there were prophets, there was a king, there was a queen mother, there were court officials, there were all kinds of leaders, skilled workers, artisans. They've all gone into exile into Babylon. Babylon is their new context, and to say it in a nutshell, Babylon is an empire. Babylon is an empire with an ideology. Now, we're not used to the words empire or the word ideology. We're a little bit more used to the words culture, society, worldview. But, but God's people now, we're going to be living in another nation, another culture called Babylon, another empire. And it was going to have a very significantly different way of life than what they were used to back home in Israel. Are you, are you aware that most of the Bible, God's people are dealing with empires? They are threatened by empires. They're, sometimes they're being destroyed by empires. I mean, you know, they, they began life in, in, in like the empire called Egypt, for, you know, long years of slavery. Eventually, they leave that empire, and they're moving back to, their, uh, they're moving to the place that's going to become their home, and they're surrounded by, by smaller empires that are constantly threatening them, constantly at work against them. Eventually, these massive empires called Assyria and then Babylon wind up moving into war, and, 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 and Israel's defeated, and they're carried away into captivity. And then as time goes on, there's a new empire that's going to emerge that's going to color the entire New Testament, and that's going to be the empire of Rome. And, and so literally, you can hardly understand the Bible if you don't understand the context of empires everywhere with these ideologies that are radically different from the way of God for his people. And that is the new context that God's people have. They're going to be in this empire called Babylon. Now, 
there, there, there's going to be an application from every one of these things that God's people are experiencing then to what we are experiencing today. And I'd like to suggest that we are now in a new context. We are in a new empire. We've been talking about this for a while. And I find that you know, so many Christians, we're, like, we're confused and we're, we, we don't quite know what's going on. We, we feel like a, a bit fearful and a bit angry because we don't understand this new empire. But we've used different language to describe it. We, we've called it post-Christianity. Uh, we, we now live in a culture that's very post-Christian, very pluralistic, very relativistic, very secular. There's another term, though, that's pretty important that we don't really understand. And I have a little more description in the notes if you want to look at that later on. I'll give you a, a quick little highlight here. But, but it, we're, we're actually living the time of post-Christendom. Not just post-Christian, but post-Christendom. Christendom was when, and really you could look back at the 20th century, we were living in Christendom. Christendom is when Christianity had a privileged place in our culture. We don't have that anymore. Uh, Christendom is when the, the morals and values of Christianity, that had a privileged place in our culture. Uh, e even if we were kind of nominal and shallow and superficial and sporadic about, uh, about our Christian values and morals, at least they were there, at, at least we sort of acknowledged them. That was in Christendom. And in Christendom, Christians had a sense of we had the ability to have some sort of like political influence in our nation, even if politicians ruled, which they did all the time. And I just don't know why we don't recognize that, but they did. Okay, that was Christendom. The 20th century was a century of Christendom. Christendom's over. The, the, the power, the prestige, the status, and the influence of Christianity, that's gone. The, the, the morals and values that we so cherish, they just no longer have a place of significance. There's so many other op uh, options in place. I mean, so we're now living in post-Christendom, and we don't quite know what to do with that. It's the same thing that the Jewish people back then living in Babylonian exile, that's exactly what they were dealing with. You know, they were no longer living in their preferred way of life, where their way, their religion, their faith was the dominant pr privileged position. That's gone. And it's not going to wind up coming back. And we have to figure out what to do about that. Okay, that leads to the second, the second new thing that the people are experiencing about the situation. And that is they now have a new identity. Now, they're still the people of God, but their new identity is they are the people of God in exile. Four different times, God uses the language of exile. You're in exile. You're exiled. You're exile. And, and to be in exile is not a comfortable thing, whether you are in exile by captivity, whether you are in exile by, you know, because you're a refugee. But exile is always difficult. You know, an exile means you're now a minority. Uh, there's a recent Afghan family that's just relocated to York. You know, they've been, been situated here. And I'll tell you what, you know, they are, they, it's almost like they feel like they're in exile from their homeland. They are, they are a very, very small minority. And when you're in exile, you are marginalized. When you're in exile, you're at a disadvantage. When you're uh, in exile, you're at the mercy of these greater powers that are around you. That's exactly what God's people were going to feel and experience as exiles. It is not easy being in exile. And I think today, increasingly, a lot of Christians are feeling like we are exiles. We are confused, and we no longer know quite how to live. And it's, there's this place called you know, a post-Christian culture. Now, by the way, I, I do want to say that there have been parts of the church in North America that for a long, long time, they have been minorities. They have been at a disadvantage. They have not had power. And, and you know, I'm really speaking about the black church. It, it's been the experience of the black church for centuries that they have been a minority, marginalized, without power kind of people, and they've had to learn how to do their faith. And I tell you, what's really kind of intriguing for me is that the white church in North America now be positioned to really learn deeply uh, and, and wisely from our black brothers and sisters for how they have done life because they've dealt with this for a long, long time. And for us, a lot of us, it's just kind of a new thing that we're trying to figure out how to do. But, but that's what happens for exiles who are living in another empire that is not their own. That's kind of the new situation that we are in. And in that new situation, there's a lot of questions, a lot of confusion, and a lot of tension because basically it becomes, well, how do we do that? Now God's going to go on and tell his people how they're going to wind up living in this new, in this, in this new uh, context of Babylon with this new identity as, as exiles. So the third thing now is God says, I'm going to give you a new way, a new way of living. And listen to what God says. Verse 4, uh, this is what the Lord uh, Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile. I want you to, now in verse 5, build homes and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage. So you have lots of grandkids 
Increase in number there and do not decrease. Okay, listen, that's not what the exiles wanted to hear. What the exiles wanted to hear from Jeremiah, they wanted to hear Jeremiah say, hey guys, you're going to come home real soon. Just hang in there a little bit because God's going to bring you back real, real soon. That's exactly what they wanted to hear. Instead, Jeremiah said, oh no, here's the word of the Lord. You got to settle down. You're not coming back to Israel, not in your lifetime. You're in Babylon for good. Guys, you know, I, look, I, may, maybe this post-Christian thing turns itself around. Maybe, but I tell you what, let, let's, let's not assume that's going to happen. Let's just assume that, that we're here for the long duration. And we have to figure out how do you now live in this post-Christian, secular, relativistic, pluralistic culture that's not like the 20th century was for most of us. We have to figure out how do we live in this new Babylon that we are, are in? And God says, listen, settle down. You're, you're, here, you're here for the duration. Figure it out. You know, the, the, you know the, the, the exiles said, how can we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange land? Figure it out. You're going to have to learn how to worship in a strange land. Um, and, and not only figure it out for yourselves, but figure it out for your kids, because your kids are going to have to navigate this as well. Settle down. You know, I just want to say, too, I just had this deep, deep sense, man. Uh, guys, I just, York is where we live. I'm going, to, I'm going to be a little facetious here. You know, in Jesus, York is where we live and move and have our being. This is where we do life. This is where we work. This is where we raise our family. This is where we have our kids. This is where we just, this is where we do life together. And there's something profound about doing life together in this community called York. You know, right now, a bunch of us are online. There's even, uh, there's a bunch of us here on site. There's even more of us that are online. But you know, whether we're on site or we're online, this is where we live. Now, you know, I like to go out there on the internet. I like to, you know, I like to go out and, hey, what's going on in California? What's going on in Texas? And you know, what's the preacher saying down in North Carolina? And I like all that. But you know what? I don't live in any of those places. When I do that, I'm just a customer. I'm, a, I'm consuming something. But, but here's where I live. Here's where I build. Here's where I contribute. Here's where I make a difference. Here's where life matters. You get what I'm saying? This, this is York. This, this is us. This is us right here in York, local. And I think that's what God has really wanted to imprint upon his people settle down, just get used to being where you are. You're going to be there for a while. We've got to figure out how to settle down and build and create and do something beautiful right here. Now, the second part of their calling, though, takes us a whole lot deeper. And that is uh, they now have a new mission from God. And they weren't expecting this either. Here's a mission from God. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city. That's, that's verse 7. Really? God, you want us to seek the peace and prosperity and flourishing and shalom and well-being of Babylon? And God says, that's exactly what I want you to do. Core to this new place where you're living is a new mission of making a real difference for the good. We are here to make a difference in the empire called York. I know it's a pretty small empire, you know. But we're called here to make a difference. We're here, we're here to seek the shalom, prosperity, flourishing of this place where we live. There was some time back, oh, it would have been last century, a, a guy named Theodore uh, Rozak, he was actually a cultural historian, wrote some very, very uh, famous books. He became, you know, uh, just very, very well known. But he, as he observed Christianity in the 20th century, he said, wow, Christianity is so personally, privately engaging for people, but it seems to be so socially and publicly irrelevant. Man, what a, what a statement as, as this non-Christian cultural historian looked at the church of the United States. Oh, yeah, man, they go to church, and boy, they have these deep personal experiences, very, very personally meaningful. But you know, when it comes push to shove and they go, go away from church, it really seems that it made very little difference. They're, they're very, very minimally engaged in, in the world. And we are, we are called to seek and work for and pursue the prosperity and flourishing of where God has planted us. A lot of years ago, I came across a guy named Jim Collins. Uh, he, he wrote some absolutely trend-setting books on leadership. And one of them was From Good to Great. And really what, what he was concerned about is, hey, you know, we'd like to see average groups becoming good groups. We'd like to see good organizations becoming great organizations. He had some beautiful things to say about that. But... There was one time, this guy's name was Jim Collins. There was one time when Jim Collins was giving a workshop, and he was talking to uh, this workshop in particular for educators. And as he's talking to these educators, he's saying, man, you had the opportunity to, to create great institutions of learning. 
And what a challenge that we need is we need great institutions of learning. So there, were, there was administration, there were principals, there were superintendents, there were board members, and there were teachers. And, and they said, just create great institutions of learning. All right, during, the, during the Q&A time, one person asked a question and said, well, listen, I, I, I would love to be a part of a great institution at my school, but I'm just a teacher. I don't have the authority. I don't have the power. I don't have the position to make my school district great. And Jim Collins says, no, but here's what you do have. You have the opportunity to create a great classroom. In your, in your organization, that large organization, you can create a pocket of greatness. Man, I tell you what, I have seized hold of that phrase, a pocket of greatness. There are very few of us that we are positioned to have enormous sweeping influence. But every one of us is positioned someplace particular and local where we can create pockets of greatness. Now, within two weeks of me listening to that video where Jim Collins was talking about that, I had an opportunity to talk to one of my friends, a school teacher, and I think one of the best teachers I've ever met. I tell you what, this person loves, he loves his, stu loves his students, loves teaching, loves his classroom, works amazingly hard to create a pocket of greatness in his classroom. He can't change the, the, the school district. He can't change he can't even change his building, but what he can do is he can change his classroom, and he has changed it. He has turned it into a place of flourishing. He is an amazing teacher. His students are so blessed to have him as their teacher. The parents of those students, the families of the students are so blessed. This guy just simply cares, and he cares so much, he created a pocket of greatness. I've got a friend who works at your hospital. Now listen, this person would love to, to see the whole Wellspan system become a, just a great institution, but he doesn't have any ability to do that. But he does have the ability to create a pocket of greatness on the floor where he has some authority. And that's exactly what he's done. He's created a pocket of greatness on his floor. And he studied leadership. And he just I want to become the best leader I can so I can create the best floor I possibly can for my staff who work here, for the patients who come in, for the families. He's created a pocket of greatness on his floor. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, every now and then, I talk to some friends, and there's a bunch of them that are here, that they actually have risen up higher in their companies, and some of them have started companies, and they have businesses, and they have positions to create, create organizations of greatness. And I tell you what, as they sit down, they say, look, it's not just about making a profit, which I like to make a profit, but how do I create a place of excellence and ethics where people flourish? Man, I tell you what, that's our calling, to seek the peace and prosperity of the city, the, the places where we are, are planted. Did you see that video that went viral? It was about a UPS worker. Oh, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So this UPS worker, you know, it's, it's actually the camera of the, of the person's home, just uh, recording everything. So the guy comes up and brings, uh, it's uh, like per, a, a big, large, a large screen TV, and he puts it there on the porch, and he goes walking away. And then he turns and looks back, and he realizes that it's really exposed. And that could be a potential temptation for some people who are going by. And so he goes back and he starts to try and pull some garbage cans and some things. He tries to do as best that he could to hide it. That wasn't his job. His job was to deliver the large screen TV and then go on and deliver the next thing. But you know what? It wasn't just a job. He wanted to do more than just a job. He wanted to do, to do work that was excellent and ethical. Are you tracking with me? Man, I tell you what, we have lost that today. We have so many people, it's just a job. It's just a job. And Christians, I'll tell you what, if it's just a job, then you're not doing what God wants you to do. He wants it to be more than just a job. He wants you to create a pocket of greatness wherever you are. Seek the peace and prosperity and flourishing of the city. Are you tracking with me? May we do that as individuals, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in the places where we work. I mean, that's where we're, you know, we're there 24-7. But every now and then, God said, but, I, but there's other corners in the city of York that need somebody to go there. And, and so you need to sometimes jump from your own personal corner to another corner in the city of York. And that's why Reach Local is going to be increasingly important. Man, we are doing everything we can to create as many Reach Local corners where we can get you guys mobilized and go and just jump in and serve and make a difference because we want to be used by God to create pox of greatness all across this community. So you create them right where you're positioned. Every now and then, you got to Reach Local and go to another corner that's not your own corner. And Living Word, we love to partner with our missional friends. That we have so many of them in the city of York, and they are so committed to creating places and structures and systems that make such a difference. And guys, I tell you what, thank you. Thank you so much for your amazing generosity for the Christmas Eve offering. We have given hundreds of thousands of dollars to our missional partners so they can seek the peace and prosperity of the city of York. And I love you guys for doing that. Thank you. Thank you.
It's just a start. It's just a start. We're living in Babylon. We're, we're, we're living in a place that, I mean, listen, Babylon by itself goes rotten. Babylon's rot. Empire's rot. And that's why God has his people positioned to seek the prosperity of those places. Okay, i got to move on. So, the, our, our new situation is, is empire and exile. Our new calling is settle down and seek the peace and prosperity of the city. But you know what? We need a better spirituality to do that. And so God has a couple things to say about the new spirituality that we need. <clears throat> Number five, this new spirituality is simply pray and trust. So, you know, not, not only do we seek the peace and prosperity of the city, but we pray to God for it. Man, I'll tell you what, guys. Just, just think about how the Israelites would have heard that. Now, we're used to praying for Jerusalem. That's home. You know, pray for Babylon? Oh, you better pray for Babylon. Pray that York flourishes. Pray that York prospers. Because as Europe becomes a beautiful community in which to live, then your life gets a whole lot better because then you too will flourish. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Pray. Work, work your hardest and pray for Babylon. Man, guys, I tell you what, we've got, we've got all, in fact, I, I, I'm sorry I don't have this available for you. We'll have it for you next week. <clears throat> We're going to give you a link where you, how you can get a, a prayer guide to pray locally for our community, to pray globally for the places where we're here. Man, if you want to do something in 2022, not only seek the welfare of the city of York, but start praying for the welfare. Just pray and pray and pray. But there's something else that is even more striking. God says, you got to trust me. Now, here, two times, God says, Israel, I want you to understand, the Babylonians did not carry you into exile. Two times in this passage, God says, I carried you into exile. Hear that for a moment. But Babylon didn't do this. I did it. God, what are you saying? God's saying, you got to trust me. I have carried you into Babylon for a purpose. Let me say it this way. Exile was not an accident. Exile did not catch God off guard. God said, what just happened? God, no. Exile was God's plan. See, here's what happens. We go right to verse 11. And we're reading about, and God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you a future. And, and, and that's, there's going to be things that God's going to do 70 years down the road. And we think, well, God's better plan is down there. It's, it's way out there. And God says, oh, no, my better plan is right here, right now. My better plan is exile. Exile is my better plan. And you say, how in the world is that possible? How in the world is living in post-Christian, post-Christendom, living in pluralistic, relativistic society, how is that a better plan? Well, Here's what the Jews did not know, but they were going to find out. There was going to be a new spirituality that was going to rise in their midst. You see, their old spirituality was built around the temple and the sacrifice. And usually it was pretty distant, and frankly, it didn't really make that much of a day-to-day -day difference in the life of God's people. In exile, as they are far away from now the destroyed temple and the sacrificial system, they're going to have to figure out a new way of doing life together. And the prototype, the beginnings of this thing called synagogue, are going to emerge in Babylonian captivity exile. They're going to start to learn how to gather together in smaller communities. They're going to start to make the study of God's word more important than it had ever been in their history as a people. They're going to learn how to pray together. They're going to worship. They're going to start to care for one another. I mean, it's amazing. What, in fact, what happens in exile amongst, amongst this Babylonian captivity is God's people start to develop a new way of being the people of God. In fact, they start to, to build a new way that would actually become eventually the very pattern that the church would use in the book of Acts. And that's one thing. A whole new and better way of being God's people. Here's the second thing, which they had no idea. In 70 years, the Babylonian captivity would come to an end. And a bunch of them would go back home. But most of them did not. Most of them stayed right where they were. And this, this idea of the uh, diaspora, the scattering of the Jewish people, they scattered everywhere around the Mediterranean world. Everywhere. 
And man, they, they, went, they went west and north, they went east, they went south, they scattered down to Egypt, they went beyond that. I mean, eventually there would be millions of Jews scattered outside of Israel. And wherever they went, they created synagogues. And wherever these Jewish people gathered together in synagogues, there were others, natives to the land, non-Jews, that got interested in the Jewish God, and they started attending synagogues as well. The nations started getting exposed to the reality of the God of the Jews. That was God's better plan. That wasn't happening when they were all stuck there in Israel, hiding and huddling. That wasn't happening. But now scattered, something brand new began to emerge. And the Jews didn't know this, but there would come a time centuries later when people like Peter and, and Paul and others, they would walk these roads and they would go to these new cities and every place they went, they went to find these synagogues where there were Jews and there were God-fearing Gentiles and they would wind up preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The better plan that God had way back in Babylonian exile is he was going to start to create the possibility of the future mission of the church. It's amazing. It was a better plan. Are you tracking with me? Man, guys, no wonder God says to them then and to us right now, you just don't know my ways. You don't know my thoughts. Man, you look at this post-Christian culture, you look at the fact that you think you've lost power and you think you and you just get so worried and fearful and angry and aggressive and obnoxious and rude and you're not seeking the peace of the city and you're not praying for the city. Well, that's exactly what I want you to because I've got a better plan. And he does have a better plan. And I don't know what that better plan is yet, but he's got a better plan. And I do know this, that we've got to say, God, we want your better plan. Man, we constantly underestimate the power of prayer and trust. And we constantly overestimate what we're going to do by our own efforts. I mean, no wonder God says to Jeremiah earlier, man, don't let the wise person boast of their wisdom. Don't let the rich person boast of their wealth. Don't, you know, no. But listen, if you're going to boast, boast in something that you know God, that you know me, that you know I just delight in loving kindness and justice and shalom. Man, that's what you got to trust in. We constantly underestimate the power of our missional witness to our community. And we're constantly overestimating what we think political power will do for us. Listen, political power has failed us over and over and over. It's going to continue to fail us. And we've got to start to say, God, we're just going to believe that we are your holy nation, your chosen people, a royal priesthood, and we are here to do your amazing work. All right, just one more thing. Verse, verse 8 and 9. There's a kind of like a, a new warning. You've got to be careful. God knows that the Jews back then and his Christian followers today, this is a kind of hard message. This has been a hard one, isn't it? I hope it's been a challenging one, but it's also been a little bit hard. Um, God knows it's going to be hard for people. And he also knows that there's going to be other people that they don't like the message. And they're going to, they're going to start to say, you know what? Not true. Not true. Exile is not God's plan. It's not. Working for Babylon, not God's plan. Praying for Babylon, not God's plan. Oh, no, man, God's going to bring us back home real soon. God's just going to do this amazing miracle of restoration. Man, I tell you what, I'm hearing that message a lot these days. The more the Christian church is fearful and confused, man, that, that message is going to be real popular. And you know what God says? Don't listen to you. They're lying to you. God's got a better plan. And he wants to just settle in, and seek a flourishing of the place where we are and pray. Do you guys want to do that? So, Lord, uh, how do we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange land? Well, we're going to sing those songs, and we're going to be nourished by their deep truth and reality. And we're going to be empowered by them to be your missional friends, to go out there and, and settle in right where we are, and we work our hardest to create these pockets of flourishing, and we're going to pray, and we're going to love, and we're going to, but God, we're going to do all this by your grace and for your greater glory. Amen.